once again for the WPG Masterclass with none other than Kai Strobel. Kai, welcome to WPG. Hi, Tim. Hi. Hi. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the time just to share your knowledge. Um, I've been following your career over the past sort of, I don't know, I suppose the last decade really, and just seeing how it's flourished and and also not only performance wise, you've started doing a lot more teaching and master classes, which is fantastic. Just passing on that. Yeah, knowledge. I did. Yeah. yeah. We met the first time, I think, in Croatia. Yeah. And correct me if I'm years wrong. Ago, I don't know. <laughs> I think it was, but I meant to ask Christoph this as well. I think he was there as well, right? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, like uh, Lin's performance with, with Christoph, Bogdan, me, Vladi, Emiko, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you I... have been there too, yeah. Yeah, I remember going to the restaurant. I think I sat next to him, actually. <laughs> I didn't know you guys at that time. But yeah, cool. So welcome. Um, Thank you. We will bring on our first artist, uh, Hunter Gross. Hunter is from the USA, and um, I'm sure he can tell you a little bit about himself and what he's going to be performing, and I will queue up the video. All right. Yeah. So my name is Hunter Gross, currently based in uh, Oklahoma City in the States. Um, just finished my grad degree about two years ago, and I've been doing some adjunct teaching and getting ready for DMA auditions upcoming. Um, I'm in the Heartland Marimba Quartet, so I've been doing a lot of performing with them, and uh, which, is, which has been a blessing and so much fun. Uh, but obviously, it's such a good to meet you, Guy. Um, and I, I'm going to be presenting um, Stephen Mackey's Micro Concerto. Um, I performed this piece, uh, let's see, maybe a couple of years ago now, and I absolutely fell in love with the piece when I first heard it. Um, I loved how big the setups were and how crazy it was, so I took on the challenge of it and um, ended up with a pretty good performance. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm just looking for, I, I admire you as a performer and, and your stage presence, so I would love anything uh, along those lines or any thoughts you have. So I, mean, I think we're going to do the first and the third movement. Yes, we will do, yeah. All right, uh, Kai, do you want to take the first movement and then maybe comment? Or do you want to just do the whole thing and then... Um, as we are cutting in between the second out, no? Then we can also cut in general and talk a little bit about the okay. movement in particular. I think that works best. Yeah, I think so. So let's let's do the first one and then I'll, uh, I'll let you go. Sounds good. All right. Uh, as ever, don't forget to mute as well if you can, please.
Alrighty. Great, Hunter. Thank you. Good. I yeah. Like it. I love that. That French movement is so much fun. Yeah, it is. It is. It also has, has a clear structure which we can follow. It's actually a really nice uh, compos on a c compositorical aspect as well, something uh, which is very valuable. I have awesome. some ideas or some things which we need to discuss. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Let's go from the big picture into the small picture. The uh, micro concerto itself, is it a particular a percussion concerto? Because I'm not sure it is actually, no? It's a percussion concerto or is it a chamber yes. music concerto? He, he, he calls it, it's called the micro concerto um, because it's kind of a, a mini concerto. Um, it's, it's aimed towards a percussion soloist, but instead of having a full orchestra, there's a mixed quintet. Um, which yeah. I think um, he got inspiration from going to a PASIC conference and seeing all these different types of instruments. And specifically, he wrote it for, um, I believe it was uh, Professor Druckmann in New York City um, with the, the New York Music Ensemble. So um, it's kind of a, a condensed concerto, which hence the name, obviously, Micro Concerto. Um, so, yeah, and specifically sense. with our setup being in the back, that that was I think specifically mentioned by the composer, which yeah. I'm probably you sh I'm sure you're probably getting to. Um, but <laughs> yes, it's definitely an odd odd concerto for sure, an odd setup. Yeah, and this is the thing. In the end, in the end, uh, probably what what the composer wanted is to have the percussion uh, in a deep connection with the ensemble. So in, in terms of not putting everybody in like behind you but more in front so it's more connected maybe mm -hmm. uh, but in in my perspective now as as from the outside i see percussion further away but you're the solist right so this right is, this is something this is something we have to keep in mind and it, then you have to decide either you want to break the rules of the composer which he mentioned in the first pages of the of the scores so maybe you also decide to just skip this and you go next <laughs> so you have, <laughs> you, you have to decide decide and uh, at this point what to do if you say for example you particular follow the rules and you want to stay in the back uh, then you have to think more chamber musical so for example then your colleagues would need to be not in a closed half circle in front of you, but more opening up so that they have also more eye contact with you. You have a right. conductor. This is this is perfect. And I think also for this kind of music, uh, um, yeah, quite a help. But it also having a conductor instead of having just chamber music, um, chamber musicians is always leading to not listening as, as much as you would if you would have nobody leading you in the bars, right? right? Um, and it's still uh, super important that there's more connection and you get it, of course, not just through listening to each other, but also seeing, especially you with percussion, you are very visual. We always see when percussion is going to happen, the next big notes, uh, especially when you have the ostinato groove patterns. Normally mm -hmm. then if, if you can lead it more and if they see you, then they can also uh, participate with you better. Because right. I saw it in, in this sense a little bit separate and a little bit unfortunate because you're actually the solist, but you're then in the back. Right. So maybe no, I, I totally adjust. felt that as well with, you know, especially performing and rehearsing, being in the back, I kind of felt disconnected. We have the ensemble on the front and then me in the back, maybe sometimes having two different times going on um, throughout the piece, especially later in the piece where things get a little wonky. Um, <laughs> so no, I yeah. totally agree with you on that point. <laughs> yeah, the other option would be that you're opening the set. You know, like uh, that you're more aligned. Actually, this would make life, for example, for your colleagues a bit harder because they would have a bigger distance between themselves. Right. But it would bring you closer to them, so you can 
you can also really think of breaking the rules sometimes. We all mm -hmm. know that composers have a lot of good ideas, but also they have some ideas which you don't need to necessarily agree or you need to challenge them. Then you have to decide yeah. maybe you have a better solution. Um, the other thing is, uh, for example, um, in the let's say in the best case for us percussionists, because we always need to look where we play. Uh, so the best solution for this, but also for a performative reason, is to play uh, by heart without scores. No, mm -hmm. sometimes it's with all these repetitions and then with some cues. So then we have to play with scores. So I totally agree, especially in contemporary music. Um, however, you have to think then how to adjust them because how they're adjusted right now is um, that you are first of all more in the back. We all figured that now and then you have these big stands of scores and they're um, situated a little bit too high right so you you block the visual um, approach for the audience so you have to put the note stands more low and more flat and then you suddenly you can see your hands and everything is more active mm -hmm. so this is um, because you play in fact active but like this we could also see it Right. Well, and there's a lot of hand motion too, with especially yes. with arm walking and all that. And we want to see that. So that's that's a great point. Exactly. Exactly. Um, in detail, the first movement is having a fantastic structure. It's really like you're opening, like uh, you're gradually opening the picture. It's like the introduction, and then the groove is suddenly suddenly happening. And then it's established. And then you go uh, basically in the same measure outward again. So we end in the same uh, in the same material as we started. Right. No? And uh, for you, you could support the idea, for example, uh, already in exaggerating dynamics, for example. Um, it's maybe it's the thing like nowadays also with all the corona situation all the recorded uh, performances we don't know how the outside perspective is in reality right. the microphones we all know on on triangles are extremely loud although you're very delicate but all these things so based on what i hear i just need to comment for me the beginning was a little bit too loud for me okay. it's a bit more like especially the fading away could be more extreme gotcha Totally agree with that. That, that is really like, uh, it's just, you're introducing the sounds, then you have a fermata, and then you start. And then it's mm. slowly establishing also with your, your music partners. And then you have the, the conga moving in. The conga is an interesting instrument, especially in the micro concerto, because it's immediately by its sound. Um, it's so bringing, different. It's, yeah, and it's introducing this tribal sound quality, which also then when the groove is starting, you also have. So it's the first introduction and then it's introduced and then it's established at some point. Mm -hmm. um, however, the conga for me, think of the playing positions, especially when you play it with the clave, later then with the hand too, especially in the beginning when you're still in lower dynamics. Uh, right, like and mezzo very, piano or something yeah yeah it's 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 also mezzo piano is it's relative for me it's like keep your pace and then you have more capacity later and mm -hmm. it's also with more like mezzo piano alone you don't need to play mezzo mezzo because you're alone either way if you have to play mezzo but you have your partners playing with you then you have to play more things like this so it's either way a bit more relative okay. um how about when you play the conga with the clave, go more to the edge to get a little bit more of the the articulation and a right. little bit more of the, the overtone. This was something I was I was thinking would be nice. It it matches, I think, also better with the with the clave sound being very percussive too. Mm -hmm. your beep, 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 boop, boop. It's a bit yeah, more. it's not too heavy. Yeah, and if you go to the center, I like sometimes it's one centimeter. And then already you have the base of the conga and it's somehow, it's a matter of taste in the end. I'm always the, the person who is going more for the extremes, more to the edge, really right. one millimeter to the, to the rim. And then if you want to build up, then you can go to the center because then you create also more volume to it. So it's acoustic, uh, dynamic and volume then connect. 
and then it elevates everything up. So then you have more capacity and it matches, I think, also better. Mm -hmm. That's um, bounce, yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah. It, 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 it works. <laughs> the bouncing, it works pretty much. Yeah. Here's the same thing. You, you, you can, you can uh, shape the bounce as well based on where you play. Uh, if you play in the center and you go more to the edge or you start on the edge and you let it bounce more to the center, you get a certain melodic pitch because the overtones are, of course, changing. You get either more bass or you get more high note in the, in the conga, no? Right. Uh, it's something to experiment. You have to see if uh, maybe it makes sense in the context or not. Yeah, I think I, I'm trying to think of what I was doing in that concert. I think I might have been dragging while I was bouncing, like maybe center to edge. So maybe I could play with staying on the edge of the conga and just doing that or even just not even moving it, just dropping it. Um, but yeah, so I think yeah, yeah. I definitely got some of that bass sound from, I think I would drop it in the middle then pull to the edge. So I could experiment with that. Manage. Yeah, yeah. You have to decide and and really experiment. And this is the fantastic thing for us in percussion. No, you always have different instruments and different possibilities. Right. And <laughs> these things are never mentioned in the score. But in the end, if you are getting on a on a on a search for yourself of finding the right context for the right sounds, this is for me always the most fascinating thing in in percussion music. Actually. Mm -hmm. Um. Then the groove. When when you have the the groove established, you can allow yourself to also transport it to public or especially to your colleagues. That it's a uh, how's it called a thriving beat. No, right. that you have uh, because this is what what it is, especially now in this first movement. And uh, it's also nice to see it from the outside perspective. Right. It's a nice right. thing because it's it's very classical, it's very delicate. All the sounds are worked out and they're very on purpose. But then at the same time, we need to allow yourself uh, to not just think and play, but also feel and play at the same time. Mm. This is this yeah. this balances, which especially sometimes when you play too much orchestral excerpts or something like this, you're getting so much into this minimalistic world that we don't play as we should in connection with the orchestra and then if you record yourself you see okay it's so stiff and you don't even hear the clarinet if you think it even or you don't think it even because you just count Shirazad 10 times all these funny things but it's established right. you know it's established in a musical context and you're supposed to transport it through feeling mm -hmm. well, all right good. should we should we check the third movement too yeah let's let's go for it perfect um, and I, I, I didn't mention this, but the, the first movement um, was entitled uh, Chords and Fangled Drum Set, and the third movement is Click Clack Clink.
good, cool. All right, so many instruments. Let's jump in. <laughs> yes, 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 this is the fun part. Fantastic. Um, and this is the thing. Now, now we have a lot of sounds, a lot of, a lot of uh, different textures, uh, and you manage, I think, quite good to to get a good set, which is uh, somehow balanced. You know, especially mm -hmm. with the with the with the beginning, with the gyro, woodblock, cowbell, and the clicker. Um, and it's always a matter of taste. For me personally, I would uh, have, for example, chosen instruments which have a little bit more sound. So sometimes right. you get more sound in putting a bit bigger instruments which are a little bit lower, something like this. Um, but they get a little bit, they give more information. The clicker especially is very thin, maybe in the recording right. or in, in live, maybe it's very sharp, but it's a little bit... Uh, small and it's somehow mm -hmm. also very high it's actually it's indicated as the lowest note right it is um and it's i think mentioned it's supposed to be like a frog clicker but closest thing i could find um because this is written you know i think almost 20 years ago now uh it's just a dog clicker it's like a training clicker thing so very yeah. high pitched um so um i'm not sure what is and i'm not thinking about what, what his intention was for all that but um but yeah, yeah, I definitely think some different timbers because there's just a lot of high, high overtones happening with all those instruments. So yeah, yeah, I think if you would get at least a clicker, you can also like uh, find a different solution. You don't need to get the, you don't need to steal the dog clicker of your grandma. You, you can also <laughs> you can use also a wood block which is having a different texture. You know already what's right. What's the initial idea? So maybe you find something which is sounding similar. So, but it has maybe more resonance and more depth than you can also use it on. Um, because then, in, especially in these kind of, in putting all together these different sound producing elements, you're creating a different melody. And this is, again, the fantastic thing in percussion. We can make music with totally random objects. Right. And the fantastic thing then is in bringing them in, in a musical connection with each other. Mm. It doesn't need to necessarily mean major or minor scales. It's the, even best if they're not well tuned, but you still hear, you, you can understand a certain note or uh, you can follow a certain certain pathway in, in music like this. And this is the connection of rhythm and, and, and melody. And again, mm. this is the fantastic thing in percussion for me. Right. Um, then we get the bongos happening. This is good, it's very virtuous. I like it. Thank you. Thank you. That's, you're, that's you're a fun part. You're a lot. Yes. yes. <laughs> and it needs it as well in the piece. It's a different texture. It also gets, again, this tribal aspect of percussion. This is also right. one of the biggest origins which we can uh, implement. And it's, yeah, classical percussion is, of course, very delicate and thought through. But if we get these raw, natural textures uh, in the music, it's most of the time very natural and 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 yeah folklore mm -hmm. in this sense so this right. for me bongos in this context like in the first movement with the conga you you get to the to the origin of music somehow through sound right. so it's good awesome. it's nice i like it also that you get uh, the power in the instrument a little more oomph. <laughs> yeah it works good um and then yeah, it's in the end. It's like uh, I I missed a bit the connection again with the with the with your colleagues. Yes, because it's, I it's single agree. information, but you have a lot of groove and a lot of information to play. In the beginning, it's okay, but later when you have more things, more elements to put together, mm -hmm. uh, if you manage everything somehow more sharp with your colleagues, that like the the kicks of your colleagues are also supportive in the melody line which you play in the break or on top then it is it would be more strong in fact right right um other than that i have not so much else to say i like it especially it's a, a big context a big contrast to the first one we didn't hear the second one again take care with the note stand <laughs> <laughs> yes, seriously, seriously. So it's so precise, but um, it, it's still a lot of fun, though. But this information, this is this is so helpful. So thank you so much for listening and uh, and for all this information, guy. Well done. All right.
As awesome. ever, great job, Hunter. Well done. Thank you. Very nice, nice to meet you. One. All right, we're going to move to um, Texas now to feature Megan. Hey. Hi. Um, Hi, Megan. The floor's yours. Do you just want to say a little bit about yourself and what you're going to play? Sure. Um, my name's Megan. Um, I'm from Atlanta in the States, but I just graduated from the University of North Texas with my bachelor's. And I'll be playing Sentimental Structures by Gordon Stout. All right. <laughs> then I'm muting myself and the stage is yours. Thank you. 
Good, Megan. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's a it's a typical Gordon Stout piece. It's groovy but abstract at the same time, and uh, it's it's a little bit your stage to to read it in a in a way that it's uh, it's yours to make sense. No, it's always a lot of bar changes, and looking at the scores, it's always difficult to find somehow the downbeats or the groove texture but when you listen to it actually then you then you realize it that it has a clear groove to follow it's just not the typical german march on one and three it's just a little bit more three three two three or something like this so this is always the thing with which i found uh, uh, which i find intriguing with, with music from gordon stout um megan on a technical level well done thank you you're laterals and all the, the the qualities you need on the keyboard percussion works pretty well no good cool <laughs> in the in the end in the end this is the thing what what works as i said is the technical um context and what you need to or what you could do let's say it like this is to dare more in the end which is uh, maybe not necessarily indicated in the scores uh, but you can dare more to play um in different textures in the in the parts for example you have the the groove section uh, I, I i downloaded the scores a little bit later i didn't find them now um mm -hmm. but there is there's the first real silent part in the middle somewhere i think it's letter b if i'm not totally wrong now is, am i right mm -hmm. it's bar 111 so. yes yeah yes is, this is the, this is the roll section no this was uh, here. Yes, yeah, that's kind of where the chorale world section is. Yeah, starts. exactly. Yeah. Chorale like ideas are happening. And especially here, uh, you, you could exaggerate finding a different sound color, either more dark, for example, a bit more low. Um, again, we're now, of course, talking through a medium of recording, and we don't know, uh, I don't know how it actually sounds in the public with acoustic. Um, but in the in the recording setting here, I could, for example, hear all the repetitions on the on the on the bars. Yes. So I was not sure. I was not sure if if it's notated in a way of sixteenth structure or if it's in fact actually rolled. And if looking now at the scores, this was also what I was thinking actually having uh, horizontal lines which we need to follow. If we would like if it would be a string instrument we would just continuously use the bow right and you could shape the notes in giving more pressure accelerate the movement something like this but the note would always exist you just shape the note and this is the fantastic thing for us in percussion it's the only element to get to the same solution in having one note phrased and developed because normally what we do is exactly we have one mallet and we put it somewhere and makes pop and then it's dead. No, so we have with the roll, we have the fantastic options to shape the notes and the chords and follow the lines. Um, in this section, for example, what you could do is play a little bit more softer that we don't hear the rhythmical structure yeah. on the instrument. This is one thing. And the other thing is uh, don't roll repetitively in a in a in a relation digu, 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 digu. phrase in a sense where where you need to lead so if you have for example a phrase and you need to develop to, to reach a certain goal then you can accelerate to get there and then you are on this level and then you can relax this is this is the thing so phrase with the speed in the role and then we don't need to think percussion style if it's now 16th notes yeah. or if it's now rolled. <laughs> and this would be the fantastic thing not not to think too too much in a rhythmic sense which we percussionists often catch ourselves think more okay. musical in the sense and here especially it's more free so you can allow yourself to breathe and yeah it's written 68 to 72 beats per minute nobody cares in a concert hall which is <laughs> more wide and i think the co the, the hall you recorded is as well having quite a height no so it's, yeah uh, having a no acoustic... it's not really it's uh, no okay yeah well i i had to record the audio on my phone because i only had that hall for like 
30 minutes and I had to film like a bunch of stuff in there. So I kind of just ran in and I, I did my best with what I yeah, had. So yeah, I think that might be why sometimes like the phones will adjust to make the quietest dynamic sound like everything else. So I think that was definitely part of the problem. But I, yeah. I need to think about the phrasing a lot more for sure with like yeah, the yeah. speed of everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In a, in a bigger concert hall, if you have a lot of acoustic, um, it's always the thing we practice in our small rooms, but then when you go to the bigger stages, you need to realize that the acoustic is totally different. So you need to play slower, in fact, to be understood. Or give give the acoustic time to adapt. If you, if you have a certain harmonical progression and then you're resolving everything, you need to give the whole time that you can resolve the chords, for example, because if you're too fast, yeah. nobody understands because there's so much sound still in the air, uh, in, the, in the hall ringing. And this is always the thing. I'm also telling it to my students often that we are practicing, of course, in these small rooms, most of the time in the cellar. And then we are suddenly on these big stages, uh, which is fantastic, but we need to know how the principles are working. So we can't or we should not, never play the same how we are practicing alone in small rooms, we can't do the same when we're in finally in concert halls. Or you need to practice in a way that you can already think of the acoustic, which is awaiting you on the stage and you yeah, can adapt. Sure. So it's a lot of psychological training as well in our practice. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. um, then we have a lot of crazy material happening no? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's in the end. This is the thing. Uh, for example, the letter E. Three, three, two phrasing, no? Um, yeah, it kind of alternates a little bit, but. Yeah, three yeah. to two, then. Yeah, yeah, we have changes. <laughs> Allow yourself to or support, support the, the downbeats in the end that we that we understand it more more clear if it's now three three two or three two two or what kind of bar we have sometimes the the bar change is not that important than the downbeat in the music so it's up to you to decide what is what um but you can give a bit more power there especially okay, i think it's in the cool. bass this is the, yes. the downbeats are most of the time in the bass you can do it. Question to you. Are you left handed or right handed? I'm right handed. <laughs> right handed. Okay. I yeah. was thinking you're left handed. No. <laughs> uh, but a big compliment. You have a good left hand on, on natural thing, like on, yeah. on, on movements. It's always the, yeah. the, we always have to adapt certainly. Like uh, I'm left handed, for example, but I was playing drum set. So my right hand is faster. Really? But I play the, a lot of traditional hand... grip. Um... Okay. For like rudimental stuff, so I think that's why yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I have the same thing where sometimes my right hand doesn't like to move as much because I feel better about my left hand. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then because yeah. of traditional, maybe you're more mobile. Can be. And this is the thing. It's it's a fantastic thing in percussion. We have to play so many instruments, and it's of course a curse because you have to practice all of them at the same time. In the best case, yeah. which is never the case. <laughs> But uh, in, in doing, for example, you say you're coming from drumline, so you have a certain background and it creates also a certain um, mobility, for example, of speed. And uh, for me as well, like I played a lot of drum sets when I was in school, more for fun, but it was really cool. And uh, I also developed through this a certain feeling of, of groove and musical understanding in, in percussive patterns, not just academic thinking and playing so in the end this is the thing we have to get all our backgrounds together and it creates in the end you as an artist and everybody is very individual this is good no i was thinking you're left-handed because the the left hand especially in the in the laterals but also in in the general movement of the arm was working pretty pretty well the idea which i wanted to give you for on a technical aspect is the the right hand actually this is why i was getting into this question talk yeah. uh, because um what, what are you doing is um this is the thing technique in the end is always just uh, a matter to get to the music no 
For sure. And if the if the music works, then we don't need to talk about technique. This is in the end always the best case. Um, I had sometimes the impression that the soprano was a bit too hard. And looking then to the video, seeing you coming from upon going downwards is creating the sensation because yeah. you don't let the you don't let the bar to cope with the with the impact which you create with your mallet because normally if if you go like in, in timpani in the end you go with the stick and then it just if you go from on top you go you you press yeah. it somehow down now and it creates this especially in the higher range of the marimba um and it is always a bit of this uh, tensed articulation which we are getting in contemporary music it's interesting to use it but in a musical connection here more traditional actually compositorical uh, it's a little bit more disturbing because it, it pops out of the phrase um so this was was something i just wanted to give you on your educational way yeah did no you, thank you <laughs> did you, totally. did you think it's sometimes sometimes if there's so much to read and then to play then we, there's of course everything at once so motorics are just happening but if you have time is the thing i'm always doing um you practice for example with mirrors that you also yeah. see if you're really on 90 degrees amplitudes or something like this because already if it looks good, you also have better chances that it sounds good. It doesn't mean yeah. <laughs> it like does, but you're at least on the right way. So, for example, instead of going in that um, perspective, the wrist more low, and then also you also hear immediately if something is changing or not. Then maybe it's the wrist, or but then you can continue your search from this point. For sure. Um, Thank you. No, of course. Um, another thing. Yeah. We have, of course, a lot of fortissimo passages, and I want to, I want to, uh, let's say, support you in searching higher amplitudes, <laughs> in creating oh, okay. more sound. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially, especially the the last. I think it's the second last bar. No, the the chords. We have the dead stroke. Yeah. <laughs> and also the big chords. This could be more more massive in the end this is the thing in the end dynamic is totally relative right definitely yeah. yeah but but for example in the second last bar it's supposed to be big loud and broad no for the last yes. chords and this could be something you can exaggerate maybe if you practice these things don't never start on the bass section because if you do something wrong it goes but um practice technical musical connections more in the higher register you always hear if it in fact creates more sound more volume if you use more more amplitude for example yeah. uh, and then you go to the bass section you can implement it and you see how how big you can play in the end um there was one connection yeah it was bar 215 it's like before the section I just I just, we just talked okay, 215 yeah. is having also this power chords and you made a separation between 215 and 216 because you played the big chords in the bass and then you have to move to the to soprano yeah. section to again move downwards so it's a lot of movement and this is the difficult thing in marimba is that it's a huge instrument and on other instruments you just sit and you can just play wherever you want but we have to move so it's also part of the not just about the choreography but also about the music because you need to somehow build a bridge of sound from the oh, bass yeah. and then no, start no. from a top and what happened right now is you played in the bass then you're moving and, yeah. then, you were up, and then you started so it was a little bit like uh, a little bit uh, square in a in a in a sound perception but also in a visual perception so in the best case you're for example giving the last note more length and in doing so giving more length you're already moving to the upper section and then you can start gotcha. so it's it's yeah. more connected rather than playing stopping moving and starting yeah. and then go right 
then it's like and then you can start connect it somehow this would be nice yeah i think also here in terms of timing you were giving yourself a little bit too much time it's i mean in the end again what i mean maybe he's not watching so i have to take care <laughs> but uh, <laughs> normally normally it's like the thing sometimes it makes sense i said it to to hunter before sometimes it makes sense what composers are writing sometimes you have to question it uh, in this context it makes sense in fact so there's a certain relation of of groove and break and the break should be in time that you can continue starting in a way then it's connected um yes and more than that actually i can't add as I said again, well done. I thought you're left-handed. Thank you. <laughs> it's oh, a big yeah, no. <laughs> Thank you. No, I, I've been having, a, lately I've been having, seeing my right hand just raising higher than my left hand on a lot of things. And I'm, I'm trying to get it back down. Now, after seeing that video, I noticed, like, as soon as I started the first page, I was like, oh, my gosh. I have to, yeah. I have to level things out a little bit more. Um, but thank yeah, you so yeah, much yeah. for your feedback. Um, I guess of I course. have one question for you. I think we have a little bit more time. Um, that's yes. kind of, you mentioned, I guess, um, how in the best case we can practice every instrument and everything. Um, but I was hoping to ask you how you do balance. Um, so I know from doing like the per percussion competitions and everything where you have all these different instruments, you have to have multiple solos ready, basically a full recital ready at once. Um, how you approached practicing that, or I guess like just even starting, like do you, like how your brain works in that regard, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> how is your brain working? In, yeah. the end, in the end, this is it's always a challenge. And it, it depends, of course, always of the repertoire you need to play. Um, in terms of competition, it's again, always a very special situation because the repertoire is very special. It's not the repertoire we normally go for concerts or, uh, or recitals, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very particular, but it's a lot of instruments either way. Um, what I always do is I practice snare drum as my, as I'm like, I'm having in warming up on the snare drum or the practice pad, I'm getting my motorics on a level zero. And if I'm then ready to go, then I can play marimba, all the mallets and timpani and snare drum. And yeah, if I also work with the bigger, if I warm up with the bigger mallets, I also I'm ready for the setup somehow like this. Gotcha. But what I'm doing or the it's in the end, the technical approach is that the technique I'm using for marimba is the same actually as I'm yeah. using on, on timpani or on snare in a condensed perspective, of course, different mm -hmm. material, different amplitude, right. but the structure is the same. And it's saving a lot of warming up energy or getting them on a certain level because it's as we all agree so much at the same time and all these mallets have different weight points and it feels super different and we have to somehow get it all together and this is why if you have a certain technical fundament find the parallels in the end also for you find the parallels in for example playing marimba and play snare drum wrist best idea yeah <laughs> and and for me for example the pressure point on mallets if i play marimba with four my pressure point is with my fourth finger for example and if i have my fourth finger ready then i can also attach the wrist and it's fluent uh, and then i'm again on snare drum and on setup and timpani is the third first and, and third and the same principle some something like this um but again, it depends a little bit in the in the repertoire you have to play. For sure. Rhythmical yeah, pieces or like more more um, let's say more sportive pieces need a lot of more stamina. So, for example, if you play setup pieces like uh, Rebon or you play uh, what else do we have? Which is Thirteen Drums, Maki Ishii, mm -hmm. as well. It's a lot of laterals. So there's, this is why if you come from the from the snare drum or from drum line, for example, you might end up having by nature already fast wrists. It's benefits which you can have as backup. And then you know, it's like, okay, at least technical, I'm on a good level to start or something like this. For sure. Yeah. Thank you. It was good. really nice meeting you. Thank you for all your feedback yeah. and everything. Thanks. All Bye -bye. right.
Well done, Megan. That would be quite a good one for you, actually. Thirteen drums. You should check it out if you if you don't know it already. But uh, yeah, I recommend it. Actually, Kai's got a really good video. I don't did, did the original WPG video like from ten years ago. Is that still online? Ah, uh, wow! You re remember? No, I, I do know, remember. Like, yeah, yeah. This was two thousand and fourteen. I this, this is totally private, so nobody's supposed to see it. It was the third round of the of the RD competition because I did it twice. I did it two thousand nineteen. Uh. When I yeah. won in 2014, uh, in the third round was was Maki Ishii. Right, okay. On, on natural drums, exactly. Yeah, it's a shame because it was I also, a really good video. Yeah, yeah, it was good, but I would play it totally different now, I have to say. I was, I'm was i a lot more older now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, congratulations, Megan. Well done. Thank you. Bye for now. All right, we're going to go to I Ching now, I think. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, so, yeah, just um, briefly introduce yourself in the piece, please. That's all right. Oh, you've gone muted. Mm, okay. We were going to check your sound, but I've I haven't had time. Okay, let's uh, let's go to Dagfin. See if we can sort that out. Meanwhile, if that's okay, Dagfin. Hey, Hello. Hey, buddy. Hey, how are you doing? You okay? Hi. I'm okay. So, uh, yeah, same question to you then, please. That's all right. Just uh, introduce yourself and what you're going to play, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm uh, Dagfin. I study in in Oslo, in Norway. And uh, I'm taking a master degree now, and now I'm presenting one like a classic from Francois Sarhan, the vice versa duo. I'm performing it with my uh, duo partner, uh, Elvin. And um, this is a piece we have played now, uh, like for six months or something. We've done it for several concerts. It always works. It's a great audience piece. Everyone laughs and uh, yeah, agreed. And then sometimes you need to like stop a bit because they need to like uh, get themselves, sort like, themselves, uh, gather yeah. themselves. Yeah, yeah, sort themselves. Like we did it once, uh, and they were like clapping all the time. And then we're like, okay, we need to like wait, for calm down. And then <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> uh, so this is a recording we just did like fast uh, actually. Um, like lately now and i can see it's a bit different maybe than what we do when we actually have an audience i think it's a bit more calm down now but we have done this some time and we uh, kind of take some liberties we don't really always try to be as straight with the tempo but more get the actual what what does the composer maybe want to get of the yeah, the intention. We try yeah. to do more of the intentions and just get more of the the musical humor in it, the things. Yeah. So that was yeah. yeah. All right. Let's have a listen. Yes, let's listen. Hey. Between the language and music, there, there, there are, there are no, 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 no. 
No. No. No. No. No. No. No. No. No. No. No. No. No. Between the next and the there is on this on side facing all perfection. The opening. and closing. This movement is not even necessary. Good, cool, thank you. <laughs> yeah, works pretty much. It's a, it's a fantastic piece. I, I played the, the solo version, the homework piece. You maybe too, if you, if you played a duo piece already from him, it's just like a similar approach, just solo and duo and percussion. I think it's also mm. the only yeah, pieces for, for, for percussion, for just percussion context. No, just these two. Uh, no, uh, like most of all his situations is like, you don't need to be any musician, like and any musician can do it. And they are depending, some are duo, some are trio, some are solo. So yeah, it's... I searched like some years ago now, but I searched some music of his and I found a lot of, uh, as you said, pieces for everybody somehow, but for particular percussion, I thought it's just these two. I, at least at this point, I didn't find something else from him, okay. but his, his, well, his music this, is, yeah. yeah? That this piece is not particularly for percussion. It just happened. It's more yeah, it, easier for percussion to do it. All this things. exactly, exactly. In the end, just percussionists end up doing it somehow. Um, it works pretty much how you do it. I like it. Um, some general thoughts, as you already said before, uh, as you figured that it's a little bit a calmer version. And it's of course different if you do it in a small room without any public and acoustic. And if you're suddenly on a concert hall with reaction, it of course always changes the performance. And in that case, actually it also helps, of course, if you have some certain feedback or like reaction for these performative pieces. Um, ne nevertheless, um, what's most important or what I figured very important for pieces from Saron is the 
the use of uh, usage of the voice in the end. And it's you worked it out, obviously. Um, and it also has a certain dramaturgy because it builds up. Ah, first first fans, very good. <laughs> Um, you're, the dramaturgy is building up, obviously. So this is very good, and this is exactly what what the piece requires. You're following it, and you're also um, exaggerating it, so it's getting more loud. You're also getting in the voice more high in the end. Um, this is also what we need as a certain terms of quality of the voice. The beginning is for me a bit too fluffy. I, I can't grasp the attention because it's for me, the voice was too low and also too soft and also not as loud as it could be. For example, when the, I think it's, yeah, I think in homework, we also start with take something like this yeah. is the same term. Yeah, I yeah. figured, I figured that I also need to speak in a more direct, I mean, I'm German, so I'm used to speak more in front of the, of the mouth but also a little bit more high. So it's because my, my voice is a little bit more uh, mid low section, let's say. And I figured if I'm speaking normally in this context, it sounds less interesting as I actually wanted to have. So what I was doing is I'm speaking more clear and also a little bit more higher because it creates more tension. And I'm not, uh, I'm not a singer. I'm not a, voice expert actually my my girlfriend is i'm learning from her now a little bit of tips and tricks how to deal with things on a technical aspect but it's interesting to come from from the side in usage of the voice as element as musical element because of course we're practicing or we have been practicing always musical instruments and suddenly we have to talk so it's a performative element too and then it's the, the thing of how to get there and how you do it is fantastic also as duo, it's always interesting if you have to face everybody straight in the eyes or you have to focus the nose or something like this, not to, to burst into uh, yeah, laughter already before starting. So this works. So this uh, on, a, on a level of duo cooperation, you do it pretty, pretty nice. For, for sounds of the, of the body, which is in the end groove, but also in the end, yeah, we can also say it's melodic, right? Because the sound of the shoe or of the of the legs are having a more lower texture, but chest and clap is more high. So we get certain pathways which we can follow. Um, the clap is, of course, the most loud one and therefore also the one which has to be in balance. Uh, you made it, I think, pretty well because the, the Almost all the claps I heard are more high and more transparent. Because sometimes I also heard versions where people are more flat and more low in the texture. And it always disturbs because it's not accurate, it's not delicate. And it's then also too loud. But still, I had the idea or the impression in the recording now that it might be a little bit too loud in, uh, in relation to the other sounds of you. The same for the for the feet. You have to take care. It's the question if you want to stomp, for example, with the flat feet, or if you just want to stomp with the with the heel, something like this, because it creates first of all different sound, but also a different acoustic repel. It's a little bit uh, more, yeah, filigran, you would say. So something like this. Keep keep just take care that everything is in balance in this sense. Um, Slap, your like uh, your your colleague is <laughs> perfect to see because in the end the the left side of your colleague is very red. No. <laughs> yes, yes, it always happens. I even have like a great photo where, it, like, you can see, I just hit him, and you can see the implant of my fingers still on his face. So, like, we 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 help, we keep nothing back. <laughs> yeah 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 no obviously you didn't <laughs> this is the thing like uh, you have yeah. to you have to practice on uh, as, as hard as it sounds uh, but you have to practice to get somehow the same sounds uh like together actually hmm. because um for example you're performing with glasses and he is not uh it yeah. can be 
it can be that he's hesitant because he doesn't want to hit your glasses. And because of that reason, he might, the sound changes. And as harsh as it sounds, but you have to slap each other right. <laughs> that the right sounds are happening, right? And uh, they have to be always sharp. So you have to, yeah. I don't know, you have to watch maybe also these videos of these slap contests. I don't know if you have. <laughs> yeah, we have watched this, like, uh, <laughs> like this slapping uh, competition in America where it's like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was like, oh no, that's too much. <laughs> exactly. But we yeah, yeah. Act actually, we uh, twice when we did it, uh, both of us, uh, we found out we had to shave. So I rocked, we both of us rocked the uh, mustache before because actually it dampens really much. The, and here we both have a little, but right now this would be too much. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah. This is also something we are considering. Yeah, totally. It's so funny because it's actually super strange things to talk about but in the end in fact they matter no it's always the question to have mm -hmm. a, either glasses or beard normally in a in a conventional context of music this is totally off topic because for no reason of course and in this context we have to think of this this uh, yeah good um other than that it's a matter of taste but you could because the the changing um switching places thing is of course a big element in the piece it's happening i don't know 20 times 30 a lot no mm -hmm. um maybe especially in the beginning be a bit more sharp like uh, it's a bit more motoric maybe like then you have the this warm this warm human hug is a more human element on stage more theatrical but for example if you go up like more motorically and then you go like, ah and then you go again it's more square and it's a bit more particular to to grasp and then later if you have to accelerate it gets more and more more emotional actually because of the speed and because of your dramaturgy which you also uh, worked out but like this i think you could give it more diversity because at some point it's repetitive obviously yeah. and uh, repetitive material is always the question what to do with it and as i said if you keep it more straight uh, in the beginning it could be interesting you have to see if it if, mean, if it works in the in the context of the full performance so what do you mean it's like stand up like straight and then you yeah have... exactly exactly yeah, okay, yeah. Shape... and then the kind of opposite after like yeah because you're supposed to be like straight face again yeah yeah yeah. It's it's, okay, it's, yeah it's it's shaping single motions in this way and then later you're connecting them obviously but uh, yeah. in the beginning you're introducing everything new everything what we see yeah. is new the whole setting the single claps then the clap to the colleague all this strange happening suddenly um and then suddenly you're standing up and switching places everything is uh yeah fantastic somehow for for an audience who never realized something like this uh on stage is uh, very particular so give 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 the signal action somehow then this this motion and then it's coming from the second phrase anyway then you can build up and then you have more space, more capacity. This was something I was thinking about. Um, yeah, other than that, I have to say, well done. It was nice. It's, it's, a, it's always a comedic piece. I like it. it Saron is, yeah. is fantastic because it's, it's very delicate and it's worked out in a classical approach. So there's a lot of musical understanding of phrasing and everything inside but on top of it it can't be serious like it's not supposed to be serious serial music it's supposed to be not how is it called in english not not it's not uh, it's not to, to make fun about it's also not totally funny but it has comedic elements and i think the yes. balance the balance which you put it inside is good so it's because it's not a it's not a clown show, for example. It should never be what we do in, in percussion in general. It doesn't doesn't matter of, of this piece in general. Uh, if it's getting uh, more like uh, 
a clown parade of, of in any sense, it's, I think, the wrong approach because we are still musicians. So what we do is serious business. But it also means we also need to be fun or excited on stage. And also we don't need to take everything as serious. Um, so this is the things which I find in Saron very interesting because it's this balance which you always have to find. We can't be totally serious and we also can't be totally off topic of being super entertained and fun because then it's also just a charade. But how you did it is nice. It worked. It's exactly the right balance. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, we have joked around uh, like we thought about like uh, ad libbing all the all the hugs and like uh, doing different like uh, suddenly like one is hugging but the other one is not or like uh, fist bump. Yeah. Uh, but just ad libbing it all the time just made us laugh and then we just lost face. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So exactly. if we do that, I think we need to maybe plan it, but. Uh, yeah, you're like we're trying to experiment with that. Yeah, also. yeah, yeah. I think and... already in in working like a certain choreography, like if you want to change, you can try. Maybe it really works. In fact, it's cool. Uh, if if it's worked out, then it's a great alteration. For example, rather than improvised, then it's awkward. Maybe then you have yeah. to uh, change character. Cool. Oh yeah, yeah. I know uh, there are uh, there are two versions, two no three versions of this. The original French one, yeah, uh, and then this one, and then there is uh, another English version with because I think this one is not done by Francois himself. It's ah. someone who did it, uh, and there. Um, but we learned this, and then our teacher told us, "Ah, we actually something this different." Then also some of the a lot of the text is also different because it's different translation. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, uh, what what we struggled a bit for this is uh, because uh, of the translation, I guess, is a lot of the uh, kind of down bits of the things we're saying or like how you emphasize the words in English is yeah. put in a totally odd place. So yeah. Yeah, I, I figured this in the beginning actually already it's the where is it? yeah uh, second phrase uh, there's one word and closing right yeah and closing would for us in english be the the downbeat normally but it's indicated end closing so it's falling somehow in between yeah, or that between. Yeah, is not between. Yeah, exactly. Should exactly. be like an up, should be an upbeat kind of. Yeah, yeah. You can, you can. Yeah, I mean, how you did it, it didn't disturb. I have to say, okay, so it, yeah. it it works. Um, yeah, this is this is the thing which we have to make our homework with these kind of things. We have in in homework the same. That sometimes the the center of the text where you have to lead is not the downbeat in the music or something like this and it's a bit awkward first but also then you have to see maybe it's a contemporary rap you see yeah. so then you don't need to really fall on the on the on the main points in the phrase with the right with the right text or something like this cool Thank you, Doug Finn. If you don't have a question, I'm happy. Uh, uh, not that I come to mind already. You said a lot of things. It's a, it's a short piece, so yeah, uh, we have talked like quite a lot on it actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. You got any general questions? Um, or you can think, and then we'll bring you back on at the end. I can think of. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Okay. So I was. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. All right, nice one. You can always rely on Dagfin to produce something unique. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. What was the what's the name of the very first one you did, the guitar one? Oh, uh, um, uh, it's called uh, "Your Your Dirty Fox" by Alexander Schubert. Yeah, you should check that out. 
that's good. Dirty Fox, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I oh. see. Ciao. <laughs> All right, good. Let's see if uh, I Cheng has come back online. Yep, yeah, cool. Can Hello, you hear us? Are you Hello. there? Hello. Hey. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. So yours. Right. Uh, my name is I Cheng. Um, I'm originally from Macau. Um, I studied my bachelor degree at University of North Texas, and my I'm currently graduate with a master's degree at Wichita State University. And today I'll be showing my um, my Marimba Concerto uh, by Eric Ewason. That's my dinner, sorry. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, Tim, because Tim has birthday today. He needs to get his barbecue. I get, I get fresh fish. Nice. <laughs> Fantastic. Anyway, um, sorry, Ichen, carry on. No, you're good. Um, yeah, so uh, today I'll be showing my Marimba Concerto by Eric Ewasons, and um, which I played last year with my school orchestra. So, yeah, I hope you could give me some comments on that. So, sure, we'll do. Let's go for it. All right, and we have like nine minutes, so I think we can hear the whole thing.
Hard cut. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Good. I have to say, I didn't know this piece before. Mm -hmm. It's it's written 20 years ago or something like this. Um, no? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I would say it's pretty old. Concerto. <laughs> 20 yeah. years. Pretty old, yeah. But in fact, in fact, for percussion, like for let's say for percussion, not, but for the music of marimba, of course, we, it's probably the the latest percussion instrument which is established, marimba mm -hmm. per concerto in general. Um, so the piece what we have here is on a compositorical side of of course more more poppy now it's a little bit more like film music the mm. chords following is more with uh, um like yeah big thirds because we have power chords happening so it's uh yeah having energy through through this uh perception somehow um so it's not contemporary contemporary music or something like this at all which which we normally see percussion um so what we have here in having, for example, all the how it's called in English, medians, like the big third chords happening mm -hmm. next to each other, it creates, of course, a lot of power energy because it's opening the space. It's a lot of overtones which are in, this, in the room uh, simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, so you could allow yourself to have more power in that sense. The material mm -hmm. what you have, by the way, is, I think, working very good because... Uh, playing a solo with orchestra always requires you having hard mallets. doesn't matter if it's for percussion, for drums, you have to have bigger sticks or you have to play louder. From mallets, for marimba in particular, you just always need to be harder because mm -hmm. what sounds super much and super loud and super harsh in your practice chamber in the cellar is, of course, then with, in this case, 30 people in your back, uh, but it's the right balance. It's always what we need. Um, so this match is really good, I have to say. Nevertheless, you need to somehow manage maybe to get a little bit more out of the instrument because I, it's obviously a lot of material, a lot of 16th notes up and down. Um, but for example, when you have the rolls and the crescendo, the, <clears throat> it's in the end like timpani, you need to let the resonance out of the instrument like you let the instrument make the, the resonance. Right now what you do is mm -hmm. you're closing down. So you have the last stroke as a downstroke. And what happens mm -hmm. is we, we perceive it as an accent. So it's loud and short. But sometimes what the music requires is length. Yeah. And you could, it's a technical aspect, which is then solving the musical requirements in the end. Um, just to do get out mm -hmm. of the instrument. So you roll and you release with the arm, you let go. Okay. This is something to consider to check out. Maybe it would, mm -hmm. would make sense there because the orchestra, they also let the bow go. So they also don't cut. So then it's, it's connecting element. Um, I have some general question for you. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, again, as before with uh, Hunter, I think we go from the big frame into the small topics, but from the outside, um, percussion concerto in general is always starting with the setup in the end. And uh, the question, for example, I have for you is who decided to put you in from the conductor left side, for example? Was it clear from the start or you thought about it or you in particular decided to go on the left side of the conductor? Um, I was thinking about, um, I don't know, it's just more natural for me to kind of look at the conductor in my le on my left side. That's why yeah. I put it on the right side of the stage. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's on, a, on a performative aspect. As we go to concerts, we always see the soloist on the left side. It's natural. Mm -hmm. We always see the, the, the cello and the violin always on the left as solist. In percussion, it's always something to think about um, because the instrument is so big mm -hmm. that you always end up super in front. And what you always need to have is a connection to the concert master. 
actually. And like mm -hmm. this, in placing yourself on the left side, you're right in front of the concert master. So he's in your back and he's leading the orchestra. So he's the, mm -hmm. he's the leading, thriving, connecting point between conductor and orchestra and actually with you. So sometimes we have also conductors being somewhere, but you need to have then the concert master who is with you visually and, and musically as, at the same time. And in mm -hmm. this formation, it's actually impossible. And also on a, on a, on a um, musical context, uh, you're even blocking the concert master, not just visually, but visually also acoustically in the concert hall. So it's also not helping the whole general set thing. So this is why I'm, I ended up playing the most of the time actually on the conductor's uh, right side. Because okay. like this, I have the conductor here and the concert master there. So everything is in one side. I don't need to turn heads or something like this. So right. it's, it's super practical and you even have more connection to the orchestra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And uh, you can, for example, have like this, then the depending on the formation, most of the time in Europe, we have the cellists outside on the on the right side. Mm -hmm. Then you put the cellists more inward so that they're behind you and then you're a bit more aligned. So you're not totally in front that you have to always turn your head completely when you're looking to the orchestra, but mm -hmm. everything is more connected. And it helps a lot. Um, this is also something I wanted to talk with you is the connection mm -hmm. because you need to, as solist, you need to learn that, or you, you need to take the freedom or the task of being solist. It means mm -hmm. not just playing everything perfect, it also means that you need to lead. Mm -hmm. And this is something which you can just learn in experimenting this situation. It's mm -hmm. not something which you can actually learn that much to a certain extent maybe but you can't do it alone in your practice room you need to see how these kind of things are working in real life in a, on the stage mm -hmm. um do you play in the orchestra like as orchestra percussionists in, in in the university yeah i do okay cool yeah, yeah because in that way for example you also realize the how the orchestra is reacting to your entrances for example on the snare drum if you have the orchestra going totally crazy ways in terms of uh, tempo, and then you have your action, and if you realize it very particular, then suddenly everybody's aligned again. And this is the the one of the big aspects in percussion. We are very on point. Our instruments are always very on point. Uh, so it, it helps. But in general, then also being solist with orchestra, mm -hmm. it needs us be responsible for for direction and it also means that you need to be in charge of the entrances for example if you hear the cello too late you have to be like come with me come with me come with me because i want to be i i'm you're too late you have to come with me mm -hmm. earlier things like this so you have right. to di direct these kind of sections um okay. if if you have good conductors they help you if you have bad conductors <laughs> they don't so it doesn't help at all so then it's your responsibility otherwise your own interpretation is getting um, yeah, disturbed, let's say, from, from, mm -hmm. from the orchestra. But it needs to merge together. Right. And this is the thing. It can just merge if you lead them as solist. Um, and the other thing is, uh, yeah, the connection is then the thing you need to maybe also think of inverting the open, opening the marimba more, your instrument more to the, to the orchestra. That you mm -hmm. don't need to go 90 degrees head change because it's impossible because you have to look at your instrument, obviously. Right. Um, but in opening a bit more up, then it's everything in one direction again. And and um, you have automatically more chances to look at the people. It helps. Mm -hmm. And you have the big entrances sometimes together. Or in this piece, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, call and response. There's uh, your your element two bars and then there's the orchestra reacting and then you're again solo and then two bars again the orchestra so it's a, a, a bit of this back and forth motif idea and uh, it's also nice to see it um, leading and giving giving it to the orchestra and then they they pass the ball on to you let's say mm -hmm. um, so it could be a little bit more 
more alive in the sense. This would be nice. Okay. Um, in the beginning, I was not clear if the pulse is in two or in three. It's in two, no? Yeah, it's in two. Okay, because um, I think you could emphasize the downbeats more. Okay. And sometimes, sometimes it's the the chord change is on the second, do di di do di di, and it's mm -hmm. of course, uh, let's say very tempting to start, do di di because it's the the double on the second uh, eighth mm -hmm. note, but you need to actually support the group, especially as it's a very yeah. poppy, more groove related piece. Uh, you need to support the groove there more. So it needs to be with more in this in this pulse, and also if the the cues the quarter notes go key go key uh, yeah, then see them also as a as a real as a cue that the downbeat is again the one because sometimes I fell forward in the pulse. Because mm -hmm. I I thought to hear the cue as main beat on all these these groove games. So be more clear with, with okay. what what is where and which relation. This would be nice. Mm -hmm. um, how how did you feel with the tempo in general? Um, I feel pretty good. I I don't have to adjust too much with the orchestra. So yeah, that was good. okay. Good. <laughs> Always in terms of if, for example, because I've felt on some 16th passages mm -hmm. uh, I felt them very fast mm -hmm. if, if for example you felt the same even on stage you can mm -hmm. be more strong for example that you real that they realize you wanted to have your way for example mm -hmm. you don't need to necessarily go with the flow Okay. Uh, in, because sometimes you have the string players and you look at the scores and they have ba 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 and of course they rush because they have nothing to play and you're mm. the one being like blah, 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 up and mm. down up and down up and down and all the laterals um, in case of course this is the case then you can forcefully slow them down or you okay. look at the conductor very angry and then he also realized that you're not pleased with something and then he also <laughs> okay. adjusts to you it helps i can tell you <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um exactly then this this uh, back and forth part we talked there's a uh, i think it was bar 116 we have a new groove passage happening Mm. It's really poppy, no? And and be more groove related. I mean, more more straight in the in the rhythmical relation. Sixteenth, eighth notes. Mm -hmm. Be more clear and yeah, support support the groove. And especially yeah. here, it's a it's a hard cut, no? Mm -hmm. We have the we have the. Ufo chords right before B B B B and then we have the we have the new part happening. Right. Um and if it's a hard cut in the sense, you have to be really square. Don't just follow the groove, but you mm -hmm. have to be the groove. In fact, you are giving it now. So now a new part, new tempo. Mm -hmm. Uh because it it happened. So right. la la. It it was right. No, it uh -huh. was right. But I would like to see you you being the groove. Like that everybody realizes, okay, this girl is going for the next part. And mm -hmm. then it's then it's somehow uh, more more strong in the sense. Okay. Um Octaves dee -do -dee -do -dee -do. it was all good. Nice. Here, especially it's a little bit more horizontal. Like the, the melodic line is getting more horizontal. Um, in this passage right after um, you can phrase a bit more extreme as well here like uh, mm -hmm. follow follow the dynamic indications piano doesn't need to be piano forte doesn't need to be forte you can stretch it based on the sound what you have in your back mm -hmm. and uh, I also said it to, to your colleagues actually in the end 
it's always a dynamic indication, but it's not, piano is not having the solution in that you play like this in front of the instrument and 40 is here. It depends if you play alone, it depends mm -hmm. how many people are playing with you. If you have a section where you have a lot of more resonance, you need to adapt higher. Um, so it's more alive. And then if you have a crescendo, you can be more extreme. You start later, but then you open up more, you know, then you give automatically more movement forward because it's like, Wah! it's like a dog barking suddenly. It's like this raw energy is then more, more extreme rather than gradual. Gradual mm -hmm. is, is, is beautiful, but it's not emotionally touching. We always get more emotionally involved through extremes. If something mm -hmm. is very in a short period, then very intense, and then you are again slow, uh, going in lower dynamics, for yeah. example. It does need to be a hiccup, a constant hiccup of dynamic changes. So Supito is not emotional at all. I mean, I don't understand it. This is why I'm not getting emotional from this kind of happenings. But um, support ideas uh, on, in phrasing more direct would be, mm -hmm. would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, laterals, very good. It was working. Um, I'm not sure if I find... Ah, yeah, here it is. Um, the experimental passage with the with the edge, for example. Yeah. Worked pretty good. Worked pretty good. I just thought, also you indicated mezzo piano, I see, instead of forte. <laughs> or somebody wrote it down. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was also thinking, um, for me, it could, could have been uh, a bit more delicate. And we, we, because for us, we know if we play too loud, it sounds somehow a little bit like, Right. Going going in the forest and you're there, there's a lot of noise, but it's not related to the sound, like to the note anymore. It's somehow very raw and not charming. Uh, right. And we get we get more this wood on on as like stick stick on on bar idea if you're more in the lower dynamic range. And I would also think it would be better if you're starting at least a little bit more soft. Mm -hmm. Not soft, sorry, the wrong term. More in a lower dynamic, sorry. Right. Um, okay. It's more crisp, more crisp, and more more transparent. And because it's very loud, in fact, it's mm -hmm. very. We, we create a lot of touch to the instrument. Very much a tuck on the instrument. Right. Um, and in that case, for example, I figured the orchestra a little bit too loud. So if this is happening in a rehearsal, either you say it's uh, we go on lower dynamics, or in the performance mm -hmm. they don't care again. You have to look very grumpy to the conductor and yeah. maybe if he's reacting then you have a good conductor okay. <laughs> <laughs> um there is uh, some motions i think it's one bar for example 175 or it happened later i'm not sure at this point um it's like uh it's like an uh, arpeggio or something like this. It's like, it's like in the harp, if you could. More in that way. Um, would be nice to find elements which are not all the time rhythm related or groove related. That you also can all at some point get a little bit out of this rhythm focus. And right. fly a little bit over the, over the orchestra. Mm -hmm. So you have to find a good starting point and you have to know where you have to end. No, it's a little bit more rubato too. It's also very nice in, in more, yeah, more film music elements of, of music to be a little bit more open and more in the air. Mm -hmm. So then in the, if, if you find passages where it makes sense, it would, I think, also enrich the piece because as it starts very grounded and very bass-oriented, right. or, then you could mm -hmm. find also this motions. Re I think also just telling you the 182 and following. It's always yeah. arpeggi. Re, re, re. And I think you don't need to end necessarily, or you don't need to necessarily start on the second 16th. 
you okay. can you, yeah. you just need to follow like they have to play the one and then you have to just continue the energy they do and you have to finish the phrase and then mm -hmm. again and then again and then it's a little bit again this more flying idea in the music mm -hmm. would, would be fantastic yeah um and before i think of time reasons um the role passage again is something of course very dear to me you have to find uh character and the uh, and the frequency which is matching that we don't right. have the note repetitions and the rhythmical element i would like to hear a horizontal note as the string players this is what we need or what we always aim actually right. um and either you have to play a bit more relaxed so more soft that you don't right. get to the to the center of your mallet which mm -hmm. is for articulation reasons very direct so be a bit more soft or you have to be a bit more slow You know, okay. things things like this, in the end, they matter. Um, if you have a concert hall with a lot of acoustics, you can dare to roll slower. You're with orchestra, so by nature, you have to be a bit, always, every level has to be higher, so you have to be faster, you have to be a bit louder. Totally agreed. Um, right. But, but still, find somehow the balance that we don't hear too much repetition, but more horizontal line, this would be nice. Right. Okay. Good. I think other than that, I have nothing to add. Okay. If you have some questions, you can shoot me. Sure. Uh, I do have one question. So um, you're mentioning uh, as a soloist, you normally would, might use a slightly harder mallet. So uh, for if you have, like for this piece, I have chorale part for this piece. So what would you do if you only could use a harder mallet and you don't have time to change for the softer uh, passengers or something yeah this is always the thing we have to somehow be as diverse as possible with the material we have if we can't change it no mm -hmm. then this is the thing you have to be as as relaxed in your technique as possible to not get to the core of the mallets which are in fact in hard right. um there is yeah this is the first solution the other solution is although I'm not the biggest fan, but in a contemporary context, you have to find perspectives or angles mm -hmm. again of the mallets where you maybe not get to the core, not get right. to the center, um, be a bit more soft in that aspect. Um, I used to do play like this. I don't do it because I need volume and you don't get volume like this. You get it if right. you play with 90 degrees, obviously. Um, but in this context, maybe it helps you have to always find everybody of has has different hands mm -hmm. different techniques different mallets so everything is very <clears throat> individual in the end um what i have i have small wrists and long fingers so for me traditional grip is very comfortable somehow okay and i have a strong grip so i can force a lot this is what i do but uh, you have to you have to find a setting for you right okay yeah thank you so much Welcome. Yeah. All right. Well done, Yicheng. Nice one. Yeah. Thank you. Fantastic work. Thank you. Uh, Christoph Seetzen wants to know what I've got for dessert. <laughs> yeah, I think everybody of us wants to know that. So. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think it's ice cream. Birthday, ice, gin. birthday ice cream. With gin? With, yeah. Nice. Or Guinness, no? Well, I think it'd be more wine. Anyway, uh, I should probably get back to WPG, really. So um, thank you so much for joining us here at WPG. Uh, Kai Strebel, it's been amazing to have you here just to offer some words of wisdom um, to the guys. And I know they've, they've taken a lot from it. So thank you. And I hope you'll join us again at some point. Um, but until then... Um, tomorrow you can tune in, uh, same time, same place. We've got Tomi Yariv uh, from Israel tomorrow um, doing a session with some of the guys. So please join in as ever.